So today let's talk about how the resistance of wires and windings changes with temperature. And I've also added a calculation for this to my calculator, so we can simulate it and some of you already know that the resistance of most metals goes up with temperature. Every metal has some temperature coefficient of resistance, which is a bit different for different metals. But in electronics we are mostly interested in copper, maybe aluminium or iron. And of course in some designs it's actually good to know that the resistance of wires goes up with the temperature because it can skew the behavior of cables, transformers, inductors and other things. At a higher temperature the resistance is higher, which means that also the dissipation is going to be higher than you expect based on the room temperature resistance. Because at a given current, the higher the resistance, the more losses. So when designing something, you have to keep in mind the temperature drift of the resistivity. And the temperature change of a resistance can be actually used to estimate the operating temperature of something that you can't access to measure it directly. For example, to estimate the operating temperature of the windings in transformers or inductors, you can measure the room temperature resistance and then the resistance at the operating temperature, which is basically done quickly disconnecting the power and then measuring. And based on the temperature drift, you can estimate the operating temperature of the winding. Of course you can measure the surface temperature, but this one is always going to be a bit lower than the winding temperature. Now of course let's boast of my online calculator or calculator, which contains a lot of useful calculations for electronics, but now let's take a look at the last one, which I have recently added. And for example a wire or a winding with a 100 ohm resistance at 20 degrees Celsius will have about 115 ohm resistance at 60 degrees Celsius or basically 40 degree temperature rise and the resistance increased by 15%. But you can also go the other way and, for example, you measure that the resistance increased to 120 ohms and from this you can calculate the second temperature, which is 70.9 degrees Celsius. And now of course let's do some experiments to see if the theory works in real life. As a guinea pig I have this inductor in this 18 watt fluorescent fixture and let's measure its resistance. And the resistance at room temperature is 71.3 ohms. It's always good to check the resistance of the probes and subtract it. 0.1, so it's going to be 71.2 let's say. And the room temperature is 21.4 degrees Celsius, measured using my DIY thermometer of course. And of course this thing has a lot of thermal mass, so it has to be sitting for several hours to be sure the temperature has settled. And it was last running yesterday, so it has definitely settled at the room temperature. And yesterday I left it running for about 5 hours and then measured the resistance very quickly after unplugging it. And the hot resistance was 86.3 ohms. Higher than at room temperature of course. And let's take a look at this marking of the inductor. These are about the temperatures. The maximum operating temperature of the winding is 130 degrees Celsius. At this temperature the average life of the winding is 100,000 hours. And they typically say the life of the winding halves with every extra 10 degrees Celsius. The second marking is the temperature rise, or delta T. This basically says the operating temperature of the winding is 60 degrees above ambient. Or 90. I'm not sure, but I guess this is the temperature rise with a stuck starter because the heaters of the tube drop less than the tube itself and so you have more voltage on the inductor and that's why it's getting hotter. But anyway, this is meant to run 60 degrees Celsius above ambient and we can sort of verify what's the actual temperature rise of the winding based on our calculations. And of course with the fixture open, the ambient temperature is basically the room temperature or just slightly above it. But when it's closed, the air around it is hotter and so all the temperatures get shifted up. And of course when they just say it's 60 degree above ambient, they're basically neglecting the temperature drift of the resistance. And now putting the numbers into the calculator, this is the cold resistance at this room temperature and this is the hot resistance, measured just after unplugging it. And now let's try to calculate the operating temperature of the winding. And it comes out as 75.6 degrees Celsius and the temperature rise is 54 degrees Celsius which is a bit less than the rated 60, but that's probably because if the fixture is closed, it settles at the higher temperature, making the resistance higher, which in turn makes the dissipation higher, which then of course makes the temperature rise higher. So in a realistic operation with the cover on, 
like as the winding can actually be 60 degrees above the air in the fixture. And I also took a thermal image of the inductor, and the surface of it seems to be about 71 degrees Celsius, which is about 4 or 5 degrees less than the temperature of the winding I calculated. Which makes sense, the surface temperature of the inductor is always going to be a bit lower than the winding temperature. And the thermal camera again verifies the ambient temperature here. Let's do one more experiment. What about this wire? It's about 3 ohms, which is not very convenient, because such low resistance isn't very accurately measured by a multimeter and it's skewed by the resistance of the probes and cables and contact resistance. Instead of it, we can actually use a transformer, the primary, and this is a 400 or 500 volt primary, which is 9.91 kilo ohms. This is the resistance at room temperature, and this time, instead of making it hot, I will put it in a freezer overnight and the resistance of the primary should go down. And the temperature drifts of resistance for metals is almost linear. I try to Google some images, hope they are not copyrighted and here's copper. Of course here it's a slight curvature, but this is 1400 Kelvin as wired. For smaller temperature changes up to a couple hundred degree, the linear approximation is very very close. It's basically linear unless you go to very low temperatures. I guess this one demonstrates it. It's linear from 100 Kelvin and it starts to bend at lower temperatures. And you can basically prolong this linear line down to zero and there is a certain theoretical zero resistance temperature, which is just theoretical and helps the calculation in this region. There's a couple more pictures. Again, it slightly bends near zero temperatures, near absolute zero I mean, of course. And from freezer it was 8.28, right after taking it out, and it's slowly going up. And of course the freezer temperature fluctuates up and down as the compressor turns on and off. And this thing recorded minus 17.6 as a maximum and minus 23.3 as a minimum. From this we can calculate the mean temperature is minus 20.45 degrees Celsius. And of course because of the thermal mass of the transformer has an averaging effect, I think its temperature settled at something like this. And now let's see what the calculator has to say. This is the resistance at the room temperature and this is the resistance at the cold freezer temperature and can it calculate the freezer temperature from this? And the freezer temperature calculated from the resistances is just about 0.2 degrees Celsius off. That's impressive. The calculation seems to be very close to the real life, which is nice. And of course inductors, just like transformers, have various efficiencies. And these are both inductors for 18 watt tubes and this one has much lower resistance, which correlates to lower losses. And this one has a B2 class on it. The worst is D, then C, then B2 and then B1 for iron inductors. B1 is the best one, but probably not very common. B2 is the next best one. This one is quite horrible, but of course this fixture is from IKEA. What would you expect? Just like a furniture made of a pile of sawdust with some plastic layer on it with a picture of wood and maybe wood grain imitation pressed into it. Well, but at least it's cut and pre-drilled with a precision. It can actually get much worse. But I prefer real wood, which can last you for a lifetime. Instead of something disposable you trash every couple years. And just like these inductors, also transformers can be made with different efficiencies. Some of them might be quite lossy and some of them quite efficient. Very often if you try to save money on the copper, you end up paying much more for the electricity. With a thinner wire, it not only dissipates more power, but also runs hotter and typically has a shorter life. Saving copper doesn't actually save copper because it fails earlier. Traditionally transformers were designed for 2.5 amps per square millimeter current density in the wire. Nowadays the current density in the wire is often much higher. But anyway, that's it for today and if you like my videos, please consider supporting my channel on Patreon using the thanks button and subscribing. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. And Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everyone.